I want to thank you all for having me here again uh, this Sabbath with you all. We almost made it to in person, but prayerfully the next time we'll be able to see some of y'all's faces in person. I want to thank Pastor Coxum and Pastor Gomez um, for this opportunity. Um, I, I want to thank them for this moment. Um, and I'll say it every time. Every time they have me back, I'm going to say this. Uh, when I get the opportunity to. Um, Pastor Coxum and Pastor Gomez, I, I feel like y'all do my connection in Hilltop family, uh, but I hope you all really realize the blessing in the pastors that you all have. I hope you realize the blessing in having pastors who truly love Jesus Christ, Amen. who truly love people and are passionate about seeing God's uh, kingdom be built up about seeing the community being helped and are willing to do whatever it takes to see that happen. So I, I pray you all are, are um, realizing the gift that you have in Pastor Coxum and Pastor Gomez and all that's uh, taking place here. Um, now I want to get right into the text today because I do believe that it's really important on this stewardship Sabbath for us to, to take a look at what's going to be um, revealed to us in this text today. So if you would go with me, whether you're flipping through your physical Bible or you're going to it on your Bible app or some app that you have on your phone, I want you all to go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 7 through 9. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter eight, verses seven through nine. And I'll give you a moment to pull open the app or to flip to it in your Bible. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verses seven through nine. Uh, now I'm gonna be reading from the New English translation, but please feel free to read along whichever version you have. Now this is Paul speaking in this text. He says, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all eagerness and in the love from us that is in you, make sure that you excel in this act of kindness too. I am not saying this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love by comparison with the eagerness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes so that you by his poverty could become rich. Let's pray. Lord God, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us today. Lord God, all I'm doing in this moment is planting the seed. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would uh, come and continue to water and, and till the ground and, and um, cause the seed to grow and bear fruit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as I mentioned, we have Paul in this text writing to a church in a city called Corinth, right? And, and I know I've been watching uh, Pastor uh, Alicia Jones preach last week uh, from uh, the book of Corinthians as well and others have throughout this month, but I still want to make mention that this church in a city called Corinth is in a Gentile city. So he's, he's writing to them uh, this, this other letter as well as 1 Corinthians about his opponents in ministry, these opponents that he has in this city to his ministry and to his call. So, so Paul is writing this letter to them to restore his trust in them. But he is also writing this letter to encourage them to give not to him directly, but to the poor in the church 
in Jerusalem, which is where we find our text situated today, right during this appeal. We see Paul in chapter eight, beginning to make this plea for the church in Corinth to also give as the church in Macedonia had done so. And that church in Macedonia, y'all, they were going through it, persecution heavy, but they gave to the church in Jerusalem and were eager and happy to do so. So Paul wants the church in Corinth to do the same. And they had started the initiative uh, last year, their time, they had started discussing it, they had started planning it, but now it was time for them to actually get the funds together. And this brings me to our first point in our message today, that it's about we, not me. It's about we, not me, because Paul says in chapter eight, in verses 12 and 13, he says, for I do not say this, and I hope you, you have your, your Bibles um, open still because we're gonna be in the word today. Let's actually jump down to, to 13 and 14. He says, for I do not say this, so there would be relief for others and suffering for you, but as a matter of equality, at the present time, your abundance will meet their needs so that one day their abundance may also meet your need and thus there may be equality. He's telling them to not be hoarders, y'all. He's telling them to not be afraid to give because they think of giving as only depleting them when it's about we, not me. He wants them to understand that he's encouraging them to give so that we can all produce equally, so that there's equality, so that we all have a fighting chance to move this mission forward. And see, everybody loves to quote the next chapter. We've all heard it before. If you've been in church for any amount of time, I don't care what church it is either. Every denomination, you've heard 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, the person who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. The person who sows generously will reap generously. Give as you have decided in your heart, not under compulsion, but because God loves a cheerful giver. And it's true. That is completely true. But we can't jump to that for our call to offering before we know what came before. And, and what Paul is trying to get them to understand, it's about we, not me, would have been a lot for them. It would have been something pretty big for them to hear and really grasp because the culture at this time had, had something called a, a Hellenistic Greek influence. It was really, really heavy. It was, it was a lot. It meant, what that meant it simply is that it was really popular, hear me you guys, that for people to take an apathetic stance during that time to many things. Their philosophy focused on how to live as an individual with situations in life that were beyond their control, that made everything they, they tried to do pointless. Basically, it was a, a why bother type of attitude. I mean, hey, we're living as humans. We're, we're living in this passive experience and can only experience what's going on. And since we can't change it, we don't have control to change everything, why bother? Their goal in life was to achieve, achieve mental ease and freedom from pain for themselves. Very self-centered. And this is the culture that the people in Corinth were steeped in. I mean, does that sound pretty familiar to anybody else? I mean, it should sound kind of similar to us in these days and times. I mean, and, and before you jump, and, and look at those around you. I need you to know that 
all of the people in the church in Corinth, they weren't all Gentiles, y'all. There were Jewish people in the church too. How do we know this? Because Paul later on in this same book in chapter 11, verse 22, when speaking directly about the opponents to him in the church of Corinth, he says in making his case, are they Hebrew? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seeds of Abraham? So am I. So there were also Jewish people in this church in Corinth, church people, the people of God, struggling with this, this concept, this conflict of the culture that they were steeped in and what God was calling them to. I mean, come on, and, and we know what that's like today. I mean, we hear it all around. Uh, we hear it from, from uh, the world. We hear it from sources outside of the church that we need to be focused on our grind, our hustle, our daily grind, get in the bag for my fellow millennials and, and uh, Gen Zers as well. We gotta be focused on getting what we can while we can. While, while you were sleeping, I was, I was up hustling. I was, hold on. <laughs> That's a lot of I in all of those statements. That's a lot of, of, of self-focus uh, motivations. And Paul knew that it was crucial, like it's crucial for us to get. It's about we, not me. Even in the church, I mean, I got to call it out. And, you know, it's not as much in our denomination. It's not as much in the Adventist church, but we hear little sprinkles of it. Hey, we hear it in our gospel music when everything is a name it and claim it type of situation, when everything is, it's your season. What if it's not your season? I'm just saying, I'm not saying this, that God isn't willing to bless and help us and, and to pour out his favor and blessing. But the way that seasons work, it can't be everybody's season at the same time. I mean, it can't be summer and winter at the same time. It can't be spring and fall at the same time. But even in church, even in our, our music, even in some of the things that we say, we hear a lot of this focus on, oh, it's my time. It's my time for God's favor. It's my time to be blessed. What if it's your time to be blessed, but to give it away? What if it's your time where you have, but it's not about you? What if it's about we, not me? We, we, don't, we don't like to hear that. It, it makes us uncomfortable. It, it challenges us with our understanding, with our, our, our comfortability. It points to our, our struggle, our difficulty with understanding the picture of God as someone, I can't remember who it was exactly, even this morning mentioned it earlier, that God is, is worthy of our trust, that God is there for us, that God is there looking out for us. But when we're focused on this concept of it's about me, you know what, it's about what we can get, hey, even as a church, I have to say, even as a body specific part of the body of Christ, it, it can't just be about what, what are we doing? Okay, how are we doing? How's our, um, it's not a building fund for just the sake of a building fund. What Pastor Coxham and Pastor uh, Gomez are trying to do with the vision that they have for Connection Community, it's not just so Connection and Hilltop can be in a nice building. It's not just so, you know, they can say, we, we got this nice place, look it, look it. No, <laughs> it's about we, not me. And that doesn't just mean the, the we that's in the church. That doesn't just mean the we that's inside the four walls. That means the, the we that's in the community. That means the, the community that you're planted in, that God has you in to impact and to touch and to help. It's about we, not me. Like the body has to be strong all over. I mean, 
it's like, and I know all of us have seen it at, at some point, this is no, no shade to anyone, but I know we've all seen people, you know, people that, that go to the gym regularly and are working out um, very consistently. You know, we've all seen those guys. It's not just guys, but I'm sorry, brothers. Oftentimes it's, it's the men that I see this with, you know, they're going to the gym, all right? Uh, they're, they're in there. They're doing their bench press. They're, they're doing their curl. They're doing their lat pull downs, okay? They are working the upper body. But then when you see them, the lower body looks like it's been skipped for a few days a few weeks, maybe a few months, okay? It, it's not proportionate. It, 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 it doesn't look like they've put in the same effort for their entire body to be well. It doesn't look like they've put in the same effort for their entire body to be strong. We have to focus on the fact that it's we, not me. It does not make sense. If we think about it, there's a problem. I'm not a medical professional. I know we got some on here, I am sure. But we even know medically, there's a problem when one part of the body is weaker than the rest. We know there's one, there's a problem when, when one arm is, is strong, one arm is fully functioning, but the the other arm is weak you can't you can't lift something you don't have as much strength as much grip same for our legs you know that there is a problem when only part of the body is strong and the other part is weak that hey i need to go i need to go talk to somebody i need to go find a doctor i need to figure out what's going on because it is crucial it is essential for the entire body to be working well together. It's not healthy to leave one part of the body weaker for an extended amount of time. It's about we, not me. The whole body needs to work together. And, and the reason why this is so important, and I'm not gonna be before you all long today, um, but this brings me to my my second point that community is a necessity, not an option. Community is a necessity, not an option. The work of spreading the gospel and funding the spreading was never meant to be some sort of isolated, insulary, we're just gonna keep this to ourselves type of thing. And like what Pastor Coxum mentioned earlier, if we're trying to step into newness, into new places that God has for us this year, new wine has been the theme so far. We have to let go of these old busted wineskin ways of thinking. You were saved and I need us to hear this because I don't think we really realize this oftentimes. You were saved for more than just you or your benefit. You are part of the body for more than just your own comfort and security of having a relationship with Christ and being safe in Christ. You were saved for more than just you. This is about more than just you. I mean, look, we've been singing, um, what is it, Hezekiah Walker's song, I need you to survive. You need, I need you, you need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me, agree with me. It is his will that every need be supplied. Are, for real? Are, are, we, are we really understanding what we're saying when we sing that? If I'm honest, I, I didn't even like it when we sung it as a kid because I'm looking around at people and I was like, mm, y'all don't really mean that because I see the way that you're acting. You, you, don't, you don't really mean that if we really believe what, we've, what we're saying, what we're singing, what we're speaking about, we, we wouldn't act the way that we do. It, it would change the way that, that we see all that we do in the body of Christ, in the, 
the church that Paul is writing to, I need us to get this. They would be giving money to a Jewish church in Jerusalem. Now, I remember I said some of the people in the church are Jewish, but this is still a church in a Gentile city with Gentile members. Gentiles and Jewish people, they, they butt heads a lot. There was a lot of conflict at times between them, but it's about community. In this new paradigm shift, in this, this new wine, God is calling all believers, all people that claim to be followers of Christ to take part in one of the symbols of that commitment to this new life, to this new paradigm is to give sacrificially, but willingly and joyfully to others in need, including other believers, but others in need in general. There is a, a need for there to be an understanding that community is a necessity, not an option. And you know what? I believe that Satan understands that more than we do. I believe that the devil knows, oh, he knows. Oh, he knows there's power in working together. Satan realizes something that we don't really want to grasp yet about community being a necessity is that if we really work together, if we really got our minds focused and set on the vision and the plan that Christ has for us as a collective, we would be unstoppable. It, it, we would be unstoppable. It, it makes me think of, you all know, I'm sure a lot of us on here have played that game before when we were kids, that game, uh, Red Rover, Red Rover, send, you know, whoever named some friend right over. And, you know, playing that game as a kid, uh, your arms would be so sore after because if you played it, you know that the object of the game is to make sure that your friend that you're calling to run over does not get through the barrier that you and your friends have made by locking arms together. And you know, your friend runs over with all of their might. And of course, if they're, if the grasp wasn't good with your, with your other friends, uh, a part of this line that you had, oh, they'd be able to break right through. But if you had a good grasp on each other's arm, if you were really connected and linked together, hey, the person running full speed at you may knock you down, but you've been knocked down together and you get back up together and the person wasn't able to make it through. If we really understood that if we really got this, this understanding and, and internalized it, that community is a necessity and not an option, we would be unstoppable. But instead of doing that, as one of my former professors would say, and, and Pastor Max knows, he's heard this before, she used to say something that her father always told her about the way we operate in our society. She said that her father would always tell her that we get all we can, then can all we get, and then sit on the can. I'm gonna say that one more time. We get all we can, then we can all we get, and then we sit on the can. It doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons. If you're canning all you get, um, then you might end up with, with a lot, okay? You might have a lot there, but then you close the top of the can or the jar and then you sit on it. You're not even getting good use of it. You're not even using it to its fullest capacity and, and ability. And listen, listen. I'm saying this from the perspective, please hear me. I'm not saying this from a place of not understanding the struggle. I don't even have time to go over the different financial struggles experienced in, in uh, times when, when I was coming up. Look, my mom is on here. Miss Winston is on here. She, she could testify if we had time. But I can say even while I was in college, there were months that I was, I was couch surfing. Huh? I was, anybody else know about couch surfing? I was 
couch surfing, sleeping on friends' couches, relying on the generosity of friends who let me sleep on their couches for months, uh, didn't have any food at times, had to go to the local food bank to, to get some food and some toiletries and other essentials that I needed. There were times, even if I was in campus housing, I didn't have anything to eat, okay? At Oak University, I didn't have anything to eat. I, I, I didn't have the money for the really great meal plan. Um, so there were times when all I may have had to eat was some rice and some eggs, okay? No ketchup, no hot sauce, no condiments, nothing but the rice, the eggs, and the seasonings that were in my cabinet, okay? So I'm not saying this without understanding the struggle and the financial struggle and the realities of life, okay? And Paul is not saying this either. He understands, Paul said in the same chapter in verse 12, he said, for if the eagerness is present, the gift itself is acceptable according to whatever one has, not according to what he does not have. He understands that. Paul is saying that. I'm not, I'm not saying for you all to give uh, um, beyond what you actually have the means to do. Hey, look, I, I'm sure we've We've experienced, I've had nothing but $20 in my account and tied that $2 and was like, woo, okay, let me give this dollar offering as well. This is all I have, Jesus. Paul understands that, but what he's trying to get the church in Corinth and what I need us to understand today is that it's the motivation behind the giving. I, we shouldn't just be giving because from what we've been said, even, huh? Even what we say in church, oftentimes the text and the, the scriptures that we focus in are all focused on us giving so God can pour back unto us, ourselves, a blessing, or so it seems. Paul is saying, hey, y'all are, are missing it. It's about this community being a necessity. And, and one of my favorite writers, she has this to say, or as one of my friends affectionately calls her my girl Ellen, okay, she says in the review and Herald, she says, it is not possible for a few to walk to heaven alone because they can agree with no others. I hope y'all heard that, okay? I hope y'all heard that because then she goes on to say in the same article by our conduct, we show what our influence and the principles we hold are worth. If self is our center, self will appear in all we do. If Christ is our center, we shall bear his likeness and our words will glorify him. But so often for us, self is the center. Even in our giving, we're not we're not thinking about community often. Now, look, look. I understand one of my one of my actually psychology professors at Oakwood. I was a, a double major in psychology for four years, and then the money for the classes got to be too much. My lord, that financial struggle. But one of my favorite psychology department professors, uh, Dr. Cook. Um, actually, the only white professor in the department, but he's an amazing professor, an amazing woman of God as well. And one of the devotions one day in class, she brought up this amazing perspective that before the fall, you realize we never, Adam and Eve never had to worry about self-preservation. You realize that they never actually had to think of self in the way that we do now. All of their needs were met. Self-preservation was not even a concept. All of their needs were met. So their first thought, it was easy for their first or, or foremost front leading thought to be for the other. They didn't have to worry about, now look, it, it's important to understand their needs were already met. You have to be good within yourself. You have to make sure that your needs are met but it was easy for them to, to immediately put the other first and then we fell. But Christ is calling us to 
a different paradigm than what the fallen world is saying we should be asking at and we should be living in. Call is, Christ is calling us to something different. Christ is calling us to understand that community is a necessity, not an option. And if we really grasp and understood that, if we really grasped and understood, y'all realize, it, and, and it not just uh, Spirit of Prophecy says it, but the Bible supports it as well. Primarily, the Bible supports that it is impossible for us to get to heaven on this narrow pathway, on this trek alone. Now hear me, I'm not saying that, you know, salvation is, is it has to be through somebody else. You got to go talk to somebody else before you can talk to Jesus. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that this work of us becoming more and more like Christ, the continual process of us looking more and more like him and acting in the ways that he's called us to act and thinking and having the mind of Christ does not happen, does not happen in the way that he's intended it to without community. And part of the ways that we begin this transformation and, and, and if we believe it, we're acting differently, we're giving differently is in the way that we express our love. As Paul said in the text, this is one of the ways that he is saying he's not commanding them. He's saying it's a, it's a testing of the genuineness of your love for each other. Huh? There was that song that we sang, what was it, when I was a kid, uh, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Yeah, they'll know we're Christians by our love. They'll know we're, we're Christians by our, our selflessness. They'll know we're Christians by the way that we give to the cause of, of Christ. It's a test of our genuineness in our love and our trust as well that God's got us. And if we really understood and believed that, that as believers, we are representing and emulating Christ and his love in our giving, that we have to, to move forward with, with what is my last point in mind. We have to move forward with the understanding that Christ has to be the catalyst. Christ has to be the catalyst. He has to be the, the moving uh, motivation, the, the force behind us, pushing us forward, the force, the, the thing that's getting us, us going in this paradigm shift and this understanding that community is a necessity and that it's about we, not me. We have to understand that Christ, Christ was the one that called us in this to this community. Christ is the one that engrafted us, that made us into, because of his sacrifice, this body of Christ, this, this body of believers in the first place. And understanding that what he's done and, and wanting to be more like him we allow him to propel us forward. And, and being connected to Christ will shift the perspective on the little that we give. Now listen, I'm not saying little to minimize what we give as I already explained, huh? Bills are due. Credit cards have to be paid off. Lights have to stay on. Car notes have to be paid. I'm not saying little in that way uh, as far as the strain or the, the realness of the fact that money is needed <laughs> to live in this world. But I'm saying this because of, of Paul in chapter eight and verse nine, he just casually, just, just casually drops this theological bombshell 
in the middle of his call for this offering. Paul in verse nine of this same chapter, we read it, he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you by his poverty could become rich. Like, what? Do, do y'all understand the, the impact of what Paul is just saying there? Now, it's not something that he hasn't said before in different ways, but the fact that he drops this in the middle of this appeal for, for the church in Corinth to give, he's saying, you know what, you've been saved by grace through faith. Huh? And one of the ways that's made manifest is by giving. It's one of the expressions of love because like Christ, we should be in trying to be Christ-like, the, the crown jewel of heaven made himself poor for us so that we can become rich, so that we can become rich spiritually, like second, um, like Philippians chapter two, verses seven or five through seven. It says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, it goes on to talk about the fact that he humbled himself uh, to the point of death and obedience in being like Christ and striving to be more and more like Christ, God modeled it already for us. And I'm talking about God, the Godhead, the three in one who have always, catch us, who have always existed in community. They've modeled it for us from the jump, from when we got here. They've always existed in community and they all agreed to give such an amazing, such an immeasurable sacrifice through Christ's death on the cross for us. It's not just about Christ um, becoming poor um, in, in, you know, becoming human and, and, and losing his ability to become uh, to be in every place at the same time and taking human form and, and dying for us on the cross. Christ was also really poor, y'all. You know it, you've heard it in scripture. Jesus himself said, the son of man has no place to lay his head. He came from the hood. Nazareth was not a great place. As we see in scripture all the time, they're like, mm, can anything good really come from there? You came from where? Your mama was who? Didn't she have you? not with her husband, Joseph, and you got some other half siblings and, and brothers and, oh yeah, mm. Christ became poor for us so that we could become rich. It's the ultimate display of God's love. God proving his own love to us and that while we were sinners, he died for us. And Christ is saying, to us today that we have to be like that. We have to be selfless in our giving. We have to allow Christ to be the catalyst for all that we do and allowing him to push us to be good represent, representations and representatives and, and emulating him in this world. Because when we do, and when we start seeing through, everything that we do has to be seen through the lens of his sacrifice for us, we'll realize that what he's calling us to do and to give is not really that much in perspective to what he's already given us. When we understand that community is a necessity and not an option, 
And because of that, it should always be about we and not me. And so I'm done. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't going to be before you all long today. And when I say I'm done, I mean it. <laughs> so I'm done. Um, but I, I want to make two appeals today. Uh, the first appeal is this. You're saying, God, you know what? Uh, I, I need to give a little bit more. You know, I didn't, I didn't really realize until this moment what a vital part of this community of the larger body of Christ and then this specific community, Hilltop and Connection community, I didn't realize how, how much of a, an integral part I was to this. Um, that, you know what, Christ, I, I, I need your help to do that. And I, and I do wanna say this here, someone else also mentioned this earlier. Um, it might've been uh, Sister uh, Brandy Lewis, who, uh, an amazing, phenomenal, powerful, testimony I think she mentioned earlier as well that the giving it doesn't always mean and giving of your resources doesn't always mean money it can mean giving of your time when I didn't have money in the bank account you know I gave of my time I gave a tithe of my time I gave an offering of my time my help my my effort my presence but for many of us we can give more of, of our time, of all of the resources that we have, that we have been so fortunate to be given by God. And because our motivation behind it can be clear, because our motivation behind it can be clear, we can allow that to push us forward in the giving. And my second appeal is this. If you want to say, Jesus, you know what? Holy Spirit, I, I need your help with that though. I, I need your help to make sure that in everything I'm doing in this walk with you, that you are the motivation, that you are the catalyst, that you are the, the moving, the, the, the wind behind my back, the thing that, that's pushing me forward in everything I do. Let me see through those lenses that you first loved us and gave us the best in all that you had, even to the point of death, so that we can now give to each other, so that we can now strengthen and encourage and uplift and build each other up on this walk that we're on with you so that we can be in our communities that you placed us in and be impactful and be bright lights for the communities that we're in and that we're around. Now, if you're responding to this appeal, there's no, there's no aisle to walk down, there's no pew to stand in, but I want you to just raise your virtual hand or, or pray along with me in your heart at home. Let's pray. Lord God, I, I just wanna, we wanna firstly come to you and thank you for the gift that you've given us. We thank you that you did not consider, Lord Jesus, equality with God to be something to be grasped or, or held on to for your own benefit, but that you gave your all for us. Thank you, Lord God, that that can be the catalyst that we use to push us forward in everything that we do. Lord God, thank you for allowing us to be a part of community, be a part of a body of believers that when we struggle and when we fall and when we're faltering, Lord God, we have a, a group of believers that we can call and we have other brothers and sisters in Christ that can be there for us. Lord God, we ask today that you allow us because we have the support and because we know that you are faithful, that you are trustworthy, that we can give. We can give willfully, we can give joyfully, we can give secure in the fact that you got us. We can give of our resources, whether that's our money, our, our time, our, our efforts, our, our knowledge, our help. We can give knowing that you got us and that it's essential because we all need to be strong. We all need to support each other in what you've called us to do. 
And Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd help us to see uh, that you should be the motivating force behind everything that we do. That when we look at you, that when we look at the cross, when we look at what you've given for us, that all that we can give still pales in comparison, still seems insufficient compared to what you've given for us. Lord God, also I ask that you help us to see and to never forget that we can't make it on this Christian journey by ourselves, that we need each other. We need to support each other. We need to support uh, the things that you've called us to do. So Lord God, as I asked at the beginning of this message, Holy Spirit, I ask that you allow the seeds that have been planted today to begin even now to be watered and to bear fruit. I ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen.